having a goal mindset um, is important to our daily lives, right? Having a goal mindset. I don't think it's by any surprise that people would think that I'm a goal-oriented type of uh, person. From getting out of bed to um, finishing our tasks, right? Goals are very important for what we do. And we have a number of mini goals set throughout our day on a regular basis, right? They, they help us achieve what we want to achieve. They keep us focused and efficient, if you will. Um, a growth mindset, though, similar but yet different, uh, means focusing on more than just the goals at hand. It means more than just accomplishing a task or a goal. Um, and it's really for our development as people, as professionals, as individuals. We'll talk about this as well, but as followers of Jesus. While the difference is, is really kind of simple between goals and growth mindset, um, the impact can actually be profound on someone's life. So consider an athlete running a race, right? An athlete that runs a race, their goal is to finish the race in the shortest amount of time possible, right? That's a goal mindset. I want to accomplish and finish this race in the shortest amount of time possible. But some athletes... Man, they push themselves to the limits. They push themselves to the brink, if you will. They compare performances with other athletes around the world. They're constantly watching and seeing where they need to be and how they can get to where they need to be, right? That's a growth mindset. So goal mindset, just, hey, let's just finish this in the shortest amount of time that I possibly can. Growth mindset says, I'm going to take in all these other extenuating circumstances, and I'm going to try to get to where I can be the best that I possibly can. And successful, if you will, right? Having a growth mindset differentiates great people from really good and, and kind of talented people, right? It's a fine line, but there's a separation there. Um, this concept was, was really brought to light by a, um, uh, a doctor, uh, Carol Dweck is her name, in 2006. She wrote a book called Mindset, The New Psychology of Success. Um, she noted that success can be better achieved by people who adopt a growth mindset who believe that intelligence can be developed, who have a desire to learn, who love to embrace challenge, who persist despite setbacks, people who learn from criticisms, learn from others' successes, right? She goes on to say they're perpetually learning and improving. Uh, they have a diverse and constantly improving goals that they work to achieve. That's the growth mindset. Uh, but then they move on to the next one, without basking in the success of the one that they accomplished, right? Again, a growth versus a goal mindset. I think everyone should adopt a growth mindset rather than just a goal mindset uh, because in my experience, I noted a couple of things for me this week in a goal mindset. I'm very goal-driven, I'm not gonna lie. And, but what I found was that sometimes one goal didn't impact the other aspects of my life. These goals were great. These goals were good, but they didn't necessarily have an impact on everything else, right? Or at times I found out that sometimes my perspective changed, right? With new insights and discoveries. I'm 41. So I had a goal one time of running a marathon. And then I started training for a marathon and realized my perspective changed. <laughs> I didn't need to run a marathon at 41. Like my knees were begging me, don't do this, Chris, right? And sometimes they change. And so what, what happened was I feel like outdated, obsolete with my goals, right? Or even better, when I didn't hit my goals, I felt like terrible that I wasn't able to achieve these goals that I set out for, right? But over time, kind of adopting and practicing this growth mindset changed a little bit of perspective. I realized that professional and personal development are continued focused areas, right? That there's always something I can continue to learn and prove upon, not just accomplish a goal. So therefore, I wasn't stuck with the goals that I set. Uh, my, my goals kind of always upgraded themselves with a growth mindset. Um, they never felt obsolete or outdated. And then more importantly, uh, I set ambitious goals. Yes, maybe. But I wanted to set them with continuous application, continuous improvements in my life. So not just a goal to achieve, but a goal to help me grow in that area. That's the slight difference between a goal mindset and a growth mindset. My kids in school, they teach a lot of growth mindset opportunities for them now. Um, they've all been positively influenced. All the aspects of my life of growing as a professional more so by the growth mindset. And you know what? We are, as followers of Jesus, called not to just have goal mindsets in our life, 
but growth mindsets in our walk and relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that God desires our growth? He doesn't just desire goals for us, but he actually desires our growth. Did you know that deep down, God not only desires us to have a right relationship with him, but he desires us to grow in that relationship with him, right? I, I think church in America for far too long, the kind of the finish line, if you will, the kind of finish the race in the shortest amount of time finish line has been just to say yes to following Jesus or be baptized and publicly proclaim that you're a follower of Jesus. But I, I would venture to say that that's not the finish line. That's actually the starting line for us, right? For far too long, that's been the finish line, and then we just kind of fade away, and nobody helps us grow in our relationship because that was our goal. But really, the goal, yes, good to have a right relationship with Jesus, but also should be a growth mindset in that relationship with Jesus Christ. Goals in our relationship with Jesus can give us information. Growth brings in transformation, right? When we are goal-oriented, it's the information that we take in, it's the things that we receive, it's the things that we want to do. But when we have a growth mindset as followers of Jesus, that's when transformation starts to take place in our life. And that's where God desires us to be, is transformation, right? And so if you remember anything this morning, I want you to know this. Our goal as followers of Jesus is growth. Our goal should be growth as followers of Jesus. In our reading this week, we've been walking through the story Bible reading plan this year. If you've been following along with us, we only have a couple of weeks left, obviously. As By the way, I don't know if you know this, but like we're like two months from, from Christmas. Um, so yeah, we were in Home Depot yesterday. My son about flipped out because of all the Christmas stuff that is up. And he was just like, and, and we have a rule in our house, we can't do anything uh, with Christmas until after Thanksgiving, which is way late in the game. I mean, like, that's another sermon for another day. Uh, but, but he was just blown away. But like, we only have two weeks left, I mean, two months left in our reading series this year that we've been walking through. But this week, we come to a, a very growth mindset uh, passage in the book of 1 Corinthians. So if you have a copy of the Bible, do me a favor, turn to 1 Corinthians. We're going to look at chapter 3. And today is a, a little bit different. We're going to read all of this, but we're going to talk about really just the illustrations that Paul gives us as he's writing to this church in Corinth. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you have that, if you don't have it, you can um, scan one of the QR codes, get the Bible app on there, and you can go straight to 1 Corinthians 3. You can also follow along with the passages on the screen as well. If you don't like any of those, look on with your neighbor, make a friend, um, get to know them this morning, and, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll walk through there. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 3, Paul is dealing, honestly, with immature Christians. <laughs> it, it's what it is. It's immature followers of Jesus. This letter, this section of this letter is written specifically to those that have said yes to follow. Jesus. This is written to those that claim to be followers of Jesus. It's written to them, and there's a problem of immaturity. That's actually what the heading of my chapter says, the problem of immaturity in the church. And really, when you look at immaturity, the, the whole aspect of that is they're not growing, right? They're immature in nature. They're not growing. These people have been boasting to others about their favorite Christian leader, right? I mean, we, we think that this Christian celebrity thing that we're in now is like new. It's been around for a long time, right? There's like this Christian celebrityism that's happening in Corinthians with the Corinthians here. Um, and Paul, really what he's going to do in this chapter is show them this kind of pattern and, and really the importance for growth in their life of living the Jesus life. Like that's what Paul is focused on. He's trying to show them and showcase to them how they're immature and then he's given little practical kind of tidbits of what we need to be doing uh, instead. So if you have a copy of the Bible, turn there with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to read 1 through 17. We'll mention the last six verses at the very, very end. Uh, but I'm going to read 1 through 17 and talk about the implications and illustrations that Paul shows us. In chapter 3, verse 1, it says this, For my part, uh, uh, but by the way, this transitional sentence before chapter 3 is, But we have the mind of Christ. So he's like, Hey, but like we're followers of Jesus, so perk up, pay attention. Like this is actually what we should be doing. We shouldn't be immature. And then he goes back into this and says, For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. So this is people not thinking about things of God, but people thinking about things of the world, so to speak. He says, As babies in Christ, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not yet ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready, Paul says, because you are still worldly. Do me a favor, say the word worldly. We're going to come back to that. Can I put a pin there? 
For since you were, uh, since there is envy and strife among you, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? For whenever someone says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, Apollos, are you not acting like mere humans? He's like, man, come on, like, this is what's happening here. Pay attention with me, church, is what he's saying. It says in verse 5, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? They're servants through whom you believed, and each has the role the Lord has given. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God gives the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are God's co-workers. When he, when he says this word co-workers here, this, this is like people on the same team. Think of like farmers tilling some land together. They're cultivating this land. It's, he's talking about land and says that in just a minute. He says, you are God's field there at the end of verse 9. God's building. Verse 10 says, according to God's grace that was given to me, I've laid a foundation as a skilled master builder. And another builds on it. But each one is to be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay any other foundation than what has been laid down. That foundation is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious. The materials that you use in this building will be known to everybody else is what he's saying. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that has, he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Verse 16 says, don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and that is what you are. Let's pray and then dive into the implications from this. Father, we love you. Thank you for who you are. Father, the work that you are doing in and through our lives, Lord, the fact that we can look at these illustrations, the fact that you desire us to grow, Lord. Thank you that you don't want us to just sit in who we are and how we are, but you desire us to grow. Like the goal that you have for us is growth in our relationship with you. So Father, help us grow this morning through your word. Do nothing else. Do a work that only you can. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You see, through this like, passage, right, through these 17 verses, Paul is, is showcasing three illustrations that we see of the church. There's three things that you see from the church. And by the way, the church is not a building. Um, we know that better than most because we've been in like seven locations in the three years that kind of we've opened up, right? We've been in a school. We've been in a hotel ballroom. We've been outside. We've been in a Toby Keith bar and grill that's now a Nike and P.F. Chang's. Um, we've been in like so many different places, you know? I mean, like right now we're in an old-fashioned casual Red Robin. So when we say the church, we don't mean a building. We mean the church is people, right? So he's talking to the church in Corinth as the people in Corinth is what he's talking to here, right? And he gives us three illustrations of growth that happens inside of people or the church, right? Three categories of that. The first one is a person. Like he, he talks about a person here. He says in verses one and three, as babies in Christ, this is like a human being, right? Uh, I'm glad that the church is made up of humans. It'd be really awkward to be like with animals, you know, this morning. They don't talk back and all that kind of stuff. I mean, like it's a person, a baby in Christ. And then he also says in verse three, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? So we get this idea of maturity and growth through the image of a human being, right? I mean, we, we know that. Did anybody have parents that when you were little, you marked your height on the door jam, you know, somewhere, right? And you go back to maybe an old home that you lived in, and it was like, I was this tall at this age, and then I was this tall at this age, and then I was... Now, fancy Pinterest days that we live in now, you have like boards that you buy people, right? And there's like this height growth chart board that has their name on it and all this kind of stuff. For me, it was just a random door jam in our house when I was a kid, right? And, and I had this marker that showed my growth, right? We see this in things like time hop. Anybody have time hop or photos and it reminds you of stuff that happened a year ago or two years ago? You ever look back and go like, man, I either looked way better then or I look way better now or my kids were so much smaller then and they're so big now. But you see this aspect of some sort of growth in your life, this differences that we see. Like Paul is giving us this picture of growth from a person, uh, but not only just a person, when you continue to read, we saw the, the aspects of a field, right? Uh, he talks about a field. He said, I planted Apollos water, but who gave the growth? God. God gave the growth. And then he says, for we are God's co-workers, right? This is that farming aspect. 
you are God's field, he says. Now, I don't know about you, but when you have a, an empty field, you don't want that empty field to just be empty all the time. You don't want dirt to be on there. You want some sort of cultivating of that land to be made up, that growth of that land, right? The fruitfulness that can come from that land. And so Paul is showing us this illustration of this person and the growth that they need and this field and the cultivating it, the co-working, the tilling of the land that needs to happen, right? Here at Journey Point, about a quarter of a mile, uh, a quarter of a mile that way, we have a piece of land. There's a ton of prairie dogs on it, but we have a piece of land. Like, we want that thing to be cultivated at some point because there's going to be a building on there. And by the way, that's what he says in the third illustration, right? We have this person with babies and humans. We have this field with, he says, you're God's field. But then at the end, he's talking about God's building in verse 9b, right? At the end of it, there's a building that also has growth in it. He says, I've laid a foundation as a master builder, right? When you talk about buildings, they start with nothing and they grow into something. We don't want that land to just be a plot of land. We want a building to be put on it. We want the building to be erected on that site and grow, if you will. Paul is giving us a picture and an illustration of our minds of things that we know that grow, not things that stay the same, not things that stay where they are, not things that are content, not growing in any area, but he's giving us pictures and illustrations of things that we know grow. He's trying to instill in us a growth mindset to move from immaturity to maturity because that's who he's talking to here, right? In maturity in Christ, that is. And surrounding these illustrations are really some kind of practical application pieces that if you just move by quickly, you don't think about, but when you identify them with what he's illustrating, you go, yeah, that's how a person grows. That's how a field grows. And that's how a building grows into what God wants it to be. And so there's three pictures for growth in each of these, right? The first one with a person, a person's goal is maturity. A person's goal should not be immaturity. A person's goal in our maturity should be that we mature into who it is that God wants us to be, right? There are three ways that humans mature, like that you can tell that they are maturing. The first one is this, they eat. I know that's a shock. You know, I'm not like a child psychologist or anything like that. I'm not a doctor, but I do know that in order for kids to grow, they have to eat, right? Paul even mentions this. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food. So, so we have this mindset of Paul's going, hey, you're immature and I couldn't give you the food that you needed to actually grow you into who is God, God is wanting you to be, right? I'm giving you milk to drink. I remember with our oldest trip, he's 13, I remember the first time we got to like give him some like real food, right? As a dad, like it's, we don't, we're not around bottles. Like I don't, maybe, maybe you, other dads are, maybe other men are, but like I didn't grow up like holding babies and giving them bottles. So when we had our first child, it was like, that was probably like the fifth time I'd ever held a child in my entire life, right? When we had our first child, which was terrifying for Libby, also me. And, um, and so we go in and so like, we're giving them milk, we're giving them all these things. I'm like, all right, you know, I mean, they're like, Two months old, and I'm like, all right, can we like, can we give him a chicken nugget? Like, what do we do here, right? Can we go to Chick Fil A? And she's like, y you're literally gonna kill our kid. And and I'm thinking, well, what's the deal, right? No, but like, I remember when I got the like, okay, to give them a chicken nugget, right? Now I had to break it in a hundred pieces, right? It's already this small, and she's like, you need to tear that up. I'm like, it's it's literally that big, right? And, and so we go, and I can then give them, but I'm giving them this solid food. And it was like a milestone moment. Why? It meant that he had reached an age where he was growing. He could digest these things. He could take in the solid food and begin to chew as his teeth grew in and all of that. His system wasn't going to get it lodged in his throat and he was going to choke on it and die. What are you taking in in your relationship with Jesus? Are you still at a milk standpoint or are you digesting some solid food? Are, are you still at a point where it's like, okay, let me hear this, this little piece, or let me take in just this little bit. It's like a little bit of milk just to get me through the day. Or are you like, are you chewing on some steak, right? Are you thinking through what it is that you are taking in? Like what, by the way, the other question is like, what is not only just like you're feeding, but what is discipling you? Because that's the piece of what we're eating, right? It's providing the nutrition so that we can grow. What's discipling you right now? Like, what are you spending your time on? 
Well, what is it that you are in taking in a way that it is growing you? Because by the way, you're either growing in your relationship with Jesus or you're not. There's no like in between. It's not like I'm kind of like, I was just like, I'm hanging out a little bit. I think I'm growing, right? I'm either moving towards God or I'm like moving away from God. And a lot of that is by what we take in. Things like social media, things like Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, things like political campaigns that are every single second I turn on any radio or TV component right now, right? Those things are, that's what we're feeding off of, right? Uh, by the way, just a, this is a, yeah, I, I debated whether or not I should say this. One common phrase in just Christianity is like, well, I don't feel like I'm being fed. Like you're, you're really, like people say that constantly, right? And in my mind as a follower of Jesus, where I don't see Jesus wanting me to find grown men and women to actually feed me, but he wants me to be a feeder myself, I always look back and go, that's such a spiritually immature thing to say. I don't feel like I'm being fed. If you don't feel like you're being fed, the, the idea is for you to begin to learn to feed yourself, right? The idea is for you to begin to intake and ingest the word, be engaged with other people, have those things go on in your life. That statement literally identifies the spiritual immaturity which, which we have if we're like, I don't feel like I'm being fed. I'm just imagining like a grown man sitting at a buffet asking his mom to feed him, right? That's what comes to my mind. I'm just like, I'm letting you in here a little bit of like my life, right? Our goal as followers of Jesus is to be self feeding on meat in this food, to learn how to do it. Now, if you're not there and you don't know how to do it, that's a different story. Help me learn how to eat solid food is the question. Help me learn how to intake these things is how we need to be moving. Humans grow by eating. They also can see and show their growth by doing, right? What does Paul say? Are you not worldly and behaving like humans? So he's talking about eating. He's talking about the things that we do. Those things that we do help us grow and also reveal our growth, right? Uh, my, my kind of story, I, I've said it before, I was a CEO Christian for a while. That was the Christ, Christmas and Easter only, you know, type of deals. And, and I, I really categorize like followers of Jesus and, and people like wondering in three categories. You have people that are curious, and, and those are people that are not yet followers of Jesus, but they're around, they're engaging, they're asking questions, they're curious about Christianity. And, and maybe you're here processing your thoughts about Christianity. It's okay. That means the Lord, that means the Holy Spirit is working in and through you right now, right? Uh, so you have the curious people, but then you have the convinced people. And I think that this is the bulk majority of followers of Christ in America today, like in, in really around the world. We have people that are convinced. Yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. Yes, I've said yes. I, I believe in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. I believe that he is Lord of my life. I've asked him to forgive me of my sins. But really, it just stops right there. I'm convinced, but what else am I doing, right? And, and Paul, again, is talking about doing here. And then you have this third category, which is what I call contagious contributors, like, man, I've, I've moved from being convinced to I am going to give back actively to the kingdom of God with my time, my talents, my treasures, my resources. Like, I'm a contagious contributing person. And what Paul is saying, he's like, hey, you're followers of Jesus, but you are immature. You're convinced, but you're still acting worldly. You're still doing the things that you want to do, Right? One commentator uh, I read this week, he said this, um, a lot of times we, we talk about the things that we do in Christianity. It's always this like big bad list of do's and don'ts and it usually pertains to like alcohol and like all this other kind of stuff. And that's where people's mind like directly goes, right? When we're acting what we would call worldly is what the Bible says and what Paul just said. But he said this, he said, worldliness is much deeper than bad habits. It's an orientation, a way of thinking and believing. Basically, it's buying the world's philosophies, buying human wisdom. It's looking to the world, to human leaders, to influential, uh, influential and popular people, to neighbors, to associates and fellow students for our standards, our attitudes, and our meanings. Worldliness is accepting the world's definitions, the world's measuring sticks, and the world's goals. That's what immature followers of Jesus do, but mature followers of Jesus move on from the worldly thinking and they orient themselves around the truth that is the scriptures. Like what are your, what are your actions say that you're growing in is what Paul is saying to us here. But then not only do they eat to grow and show their growth, not only do they do things to grow and show their growth, but also how about the things that they say? Paul says, I Belong to, they say, I belong to Paul, another, I belong to Apollos, right? He's talking about what these followers of Jesus have said here, right? 
And, and he's saying that when they say things like that, it identifies their immaturity. So literally, by the things that we say to other people, we know and can tell the maturity level of where we are as followers of Jesus. I, I remember early in my faith relationship with Jesus, and, and I'll just be honest, like I would say some stuff with one group of people, and then with another group of people, I'd say some other things, right? With my Christian friends, boy, they thought I was living that Christian life, right? And then with my worldly friends, they would have never known I was living the Christian life, right? Because I was saying the things I wanted to in each of these circles. As a matter of fact, I distinctly remember uh, walking through with a guy that was mentoring and discipling me. The first time that I, I like I was talking in conversation, we were at a softball game. Um, I'm fairly competitive. Um, and when I say that like I have a problem. Um, and so like I'm super competitive. We had lost this ball game, man. And these guys were, they were acting worldly, these worldly immature people. Um, they were, and I got mad and I was livid and I cussed like right in the middle of talking to this guy that had been walking and discipling through me, right? And now like, again, here's the thing. It's not this language, this do's and don'ts, but what happened was I distinctly remember that because as soon as I said it, I was like, oh snap, he's about to like hold me accountable. Like, are the things that you're saying worldly or are the things that you're saying look like a follower of Jesus, right? Now, I was actually excited that I said that in front of him, right? Because it identified to me that I was growing. Because before in this circle, I could talk like that and it never meant anything to me. But the second I said this over here, it identified that I had this deepness in me that I wanted to grow in this area, right? And, and so I could just remember walking through that and going, okay, I need to be better in all of these circles in this thing because it's not one circle or the other. It's the things that I say no matter who is around me because the Lord Jesus is watching me, right? Very frankly, if we're followers of Jesus in the room and we are still stuck in our, our personal immature levels like this that he's given us in this illustration in our relationship with him, where we've been there for years, if today my relationship with Jesus looks the same as it did a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, then we're like grown adults with diapers on in the room and someone feeding us milk. Like that's just the analogy that Paul is giving us. And I know if I live long enough, I'll be a grown adult with a diaper on, right? You know, that's, that's the beauty of getting older. But I'm talking about like grown adults that don't need to have diapers on. And that's us sitting there getting a bottle from our mom. That's what Paul is saying right here. Have you matured in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Like, would others indicate that you are more mature in your relationship today than you were the last time you were around them? Would friends in other parts of the country that you don't see very often, would they say, man, you've really matured in your relationship with Jesus? Like, Paul is giving us this picture of a person that grows, shows maturity in these ways. Secondly, with this field component, he shows that a field's goal is fruitfulness. Like the goal of a field is to provide fruit from the field, whether that be grass, trees, plants or whatever that may be, the goal of having a field would be to be fruit from that field, right? He talks about these components of planting and watering and then watching. I planted, Apollos watered, and then God gave the growth. I want to watch God do all of the work. One thing that we say a lot here is the effort is mine, the results are the Lord's. The effort is mine to plant and water, the results are the Lord's. So I don't want to be caught going, I didn't give the effort to grow anything. I just sat back and asked God to do everything. And God's going, yes, prayer is for sure the work. But I also need you to like plant and water and not just sit back and ask you to do it. Like I, I had a buddy that he was applying for a job. He'd walked through a ton of, of job uh, setbacks and laid off and everything. And I said, hey, man, how you, how you doing you know, with that? He said, I'm doing good. He's like, man, I'm just really praying for God to, to give me the job. Um, that, that he wants me to have. And I was like, awesome, man. You feel good and confident about that. I said, man, so like, why don't you send me your resume um, and I'll try to get it out in this field to anybody that I know and I'll help you out. He's like, I don't have a resume yet. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, so I thought you said you were moving. He said, yeah, man, I'm asking God to like really do it. I'm like, I don't, I'm not speaking for God, but I'm sitting there going, like, if I am, I'm going, could you at least make a resume? Like, it's like, I can, I can turn water into wine, man, but like, I don't know if I could just give you a job with no resume or anything. Like, I just sit there and sometimes we're like, hey, man, God's got it, but I'm just going to sit back and do nothing about it. Hey, God, help me in my life. I'm just, just waiting on you to do it, God. I mean, he says here, like, I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the growth. Sometimes I think God's not given the growth because we're not planting or we're not watering in our fields, Right? 
Uh, our neighbor, um, they, they, they put in a patio in their backyard. And this is a rented house. And, and Tim talked about this a couple months ago when he's talking about water and grass and everything, if you remember his message. And, and they put in a patio. And when they did, they cracked one of their sprinkler lines. And so what they did, this was like two years ago, what they did was they just turned off their water. Right, And they didn't want to fix it. It was going to be too expensive. They didn't have the money to repair all their water lines. And so as you can imagine, in Colorado, where there's no moisture, um, it is like it looked like this concrete next door to us, right, in their grass. Now, I also live here in Central Park, and so we're, we're talking about like the five-foot stretch of land that we have here. <laughs> but it's like, this, it's all we got, man. Can you make this look good? And, and so we have this stretch. It's just dead until finally I was like, hey, man, you need to do something about this. And so he got a person to come out, repair the line. They started watering it, right, because it was literally just grass, dead grass, right? And, and because we can't, we live in Colorado, we can't just wait on rain to come and grow our grass. We can't just wait on all this moisture that we're going to have to grow it. It's dry and there's no moisture. But here's the also the, the negative aspect of that. Because everything died, the good grass, you know what grew back in there? Weeds. And so great, it's awesome. It's like at least green, so you can somewhat be like, oh, it's a consistent patch of grass and land here. But now these weeds grew. And you know what happened with these weeds as it grew back? The seeds blew all over our grass. So guess who now has got a bunch of weeds and I have to work twice as hard because of someone else not working or tilling or planting and watering in their weeds. Do you know that when you are not taking care of you, when you are not walking through your maturity level, when you're not trying to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ, it can actually impact the other people around you? Like it can impact the other people around you. And, and so if you are not planting and watering and you're just simply sitting back and going, hey, God, do something, like turn water into wine here, like you are damaging the people that may be around you and the seeds that are flowing in their yards. One way that we would ask this question would be like, is your field riddled with weeds? Is your life, the field of your life riddled with weeds? And one question I would, was thinking of, like, well, how would I ask this? Like, if I didn't know how to do this, how, okay, then how can I plant and water? What can I do to plant and water in my yard, Chris? Well, we have the 5% life on that banner back there. We say it. You're going to get tired of hearing me say it. But like the 5% life is planting and watering, right? It's spending 1% of your time in God time daily. It's spending 1% of your week in group uh, gather time like you are this morning. It's spending 1% of your month in group time growing with other people. It's spending 1% of your quarter in grow time learning and understanding how God has wired you and growing in the skills and gifts that he's given you. And then it's spending 1% of your year going on mission and serving other people. Like, that's the way you plant and water. And I'm telling you this, you do that, watch God give some growth. You read daily, you gather weekly, you get together in groups monthly, you learn how God has wired you, and you go on mission serving together. I'm telling you what, you will grow as a follower of Jesus. That's planting and watering, right? Right? That's working the field. That's cultivating a field to see some fruit because fruitfulness is the goal in the field. And I think the third component that we see here is this aspect of a building. Paul gives us this, this building component, right? And a building's goal is quality. <laughs> it's not just to get a building, but it's to have a quality building. Paul discusses being a skilled master builder, right? He knew how to have quality buildings, and he knew the right components to having a quality building. Just like the right component to a person is what they eat, how, what they do, and what they say, the right component for a building to be quality would be to have the right foundation, the right materials, and the right motives, right? If we're going to look at the right foundation, like what is foundational to your growth? We mentioned this earlier, but if, like, if I'm discipled more by CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC, then my growth is going to be more towards that, right? If I'm discipled more by social media, which, by the way, the new indicators say that the average social media user spends two and a half hours a day on social media. If that's your foundation, that's where you're going to grow, right? If that's your foundation, that's where you're going to be. Like, what is the first thing that happens when you wake up in the morning? Is the first thing that happens you grab your phone to check what happened at night? Who liked, who commented, who shared, who did something spectacular? Or it's like before your foot goes on the ground, are you seeking the Lord? I'm not saying you got to get up and read, but man, even on your walk to the living room to make your coffee, because if you're smart, you're making coffee first thing in the morning, <sighs> or tea, whatever, <laughs> Coke, I don't know. I pray for those of you that don't drink coffee. 
But if, if, if your first thing is not to take a step and say, thank you, Lord, for letting me wake up this morning. Thank you, Lord, for letting me have breath in my lungs. Thank you, Lord, for the friends and or family that you've given me. Thank you for the job I'm getting ready for this morning to go to. Thank you for the people I'm going to encounter today. Like that's foundational. That's quality. Paul says the foundation is Jesus Christ, right? One of my favorite songs right now is Firm Foundation for so many different reasons. And there's a song, if you don't know it, go listen to it, Firm Foundation. The wrong foundation in your life will change your joy with whatever circumstance is going on, right? If your foundation is to wake up and see how many people liked or commented on your social media or what happened in the world or whether Tennessee won or lost in a stupid football game with 18 to 22-year-olds, way too invested yesterday. <laughs> like if that is your joy and your foundation, if they lose, your joy is gone. If no one likes, your joy is gone. If no one comments, your joy is gone. The great thing about having a firm foundation in Jesus Christ is he doesn't change, church. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That foundation is solid. That foundation is how we grow. That foundation is what we should build our life upon. He he literally says it. Rain came, wind blew, but my house was built on you. Rain came, wind blew, but my house had a foundation on you. My joy won't change in that one. My joy can stay the same. Not only that, like that's a component of the materials, right? If, if these materials that we have are the worldly materials, then they will come as the wind changes, right? They will come and go. I, Jenko jeans used to be a thing when I was in like college, right? Those of you that are like 40, you're going, really? You're going there, Jenko jeans. They're coming back right now. That's a terrible decision, by the way. <laughs> terrible decision. And, and you look at it and it's like, hey, if it comes and ebbs and flows with what the world is saying, we're looking back and going, I got to go get some Jenko jeans, right? And I'm just like, no, man, Lululemon all the way. Um, <laughs> sorry. And then the last thing is our motives, our foundation in the building to be quality, our materials in the building to be quality, but then our motives. And that's what the last six verses talk about. Read those this week. But in verses 18 to 23, it deals with our motives. He even says, let no one deceive himself. Don't let your motives deceive yourself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool so that he can become wise. Verse 19 says that the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. Our motives that are worldly in nature is foolishness with God. If your motive is in line with the world how, on how you're going to grow your building, on how you're going to grow as a person, on how your field is going to produce fruit, then you are moving with the wrong motives. Like if the motive is to build the house your neighbor has, your motives are off. If your motive is to uh, like have the things you didn't even have when you grew up, your motives are off. If your motive is to have as many followers as your friends have or is that person you want to be like has, your motives are off. Like our motives need to be rested on who we are in Jesus Christ. We don't need to keep up with the Joneses, a struggle that I have, right? We don't need to keep up with the people that we want to be like. Our motive needs to be growing in Jesus. As a person, we should mature. As a field, we should produce fruit. As a building, we should have the quality that God desires us to have. Church, our goal is growth. Like that's the growth mindset that we should have. Do you have a goal of growth in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Like, do you set out and ask, how can I grow in my relationship with Jesus today? Like that's our goal. And I think in this like get better, bigger, faster, stronger world that we live in, I'm reminded on how we don't set our same goals for growth in that area that we do in our life, right? I care too much about my whoop device and my recovery, right, than I do about my growth metrics in my relationship with Jesus. I care more about murfing and running marathons than I do about memorizing Scripture and learning things that I want to learn. Our goals should be focused on a growth mindset in our relationship with Jesus. And here's the beauty of all of this as I close. Like the beauty of what Paul is actually showing them here in Corinthians is that they're weak. They're immature and that they're weak. But the beauty is he also talks about how immature 
he is at times and how weak he is at times. And the beauty in that is the picture of the gospel, where in our weaknesses, we can still be strong. In our weaknesses, we still have Jesus. What the world would say was frail for Jesus to be murdered on a cross became the penultimate thing that has ever happened in the history of the world. His death, his burial, his resurrection, mocked by many as a weakness, mocked by many as a sign that he wasn't the Son of God, actually revealed that he was the Son of God. And so if you're sitting here this morning and you're going, man, I I got a long way to go, you are in good company. And some of you I don't even know that well, but you're in good company. But in our weaknesses, we boast all the more in Jesus Christ, who is the one that gives us the growth. In our weaknesses, we understand our need for him to help us grow. In our weaknesses, we understand the track that we need to walk through so that we can grow in who Jesus made us to be. Even closing out the book of 2 Corinthians, in chapter 13, verse 9, Paul says this, we pray also that you become fully mature. He ties this big bow on it at the end of 2 Corinthians to say, we pray also that you become fully mature. God's goal for you is growth in a relationship with him. God's goal for you is to put that into practice, to eat, to do, to say, right? To plant, to water, to see him grow, to have the right foundation, to have the right materials in your life, to have the right motives for who it is that he made you to be, church. So as Hunter and the team come back up here, the the question I want you to ask How are you growing? It's a simple question. What is your door jam for growth in your life? What is the thing that's indicating whether or not you're growing in your relationship with Jesus or whether you're still where you were five years ago, one year ago, six months ago? Our goal is growth. That's what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians. Our goal as people should be matured in our relationship with Jesus Christ. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, how am I growing? How are you growing? So for about 30 seconds, I just want you to think and process. Am I growing? And if I'm not, or if I have a track that I need to go on, to grow significantly more, if I need to be fed, how am I going to grow? What am I going to do to grow? What measures can I put in place to grow? What area of the 5% life do I need help with? And the question that I really want you to ask is, who can I tell today? Who can I let know, hey, I, I want you to help me grow? I want you to hold me accountable to growing. So bow with me, 30 seconds. Am I growing? And how do I take the next step to grow? Father, we stand here before you, sit here before you as people that know we have a long way to go. But we're also grateful that we know the scriptures say that our our sanctification or our growing process into becoming like Jesus is a lifelong process. So Father, we want to commit to you. I want to commit to you my desire to grow in the areas that I'm weak. My desire to grow in the areas that I'm immature. And that desire to grow in the areas that I've stunted my growth from decisions that I've made. So Father, help us. Lord, and I pray that if there's anyone here today that says, man, I'm just curious. 
Now, I'm just curious as to what this living the Jesus life is all about. Father, I pray today would be the day that they give their life to you. Recognizing your death, your burial, your, resur- your resurrection. Asking you to forgive them of their sin and living outside of the way that you desire them to live, Lord, and saying yes to you leading their life. That God, in today, they would be on a growth journey that would be so fulfilling and so rewarding. God, it would be like anything they've, it would be like nothing they've ever experienced before. Do the work that only you can. It's in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And do me a favor, let's stand and worship one more time before we close out this morning.